And so we are going to get started with a mentee here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we want people to get creative. So speculative pedagogy is, as we'll see, like about envisioning, speculating about other, other possibilities. So if you could design your classroom to be what you want it to be, anything at all in the world, what is the first change you would make? So you can either scan the QR code, you can go to menti.com and put in that code that's on the screen there. Mm -hmm. And do you want to? Yes, I'm going to switch to the presentation. Mm -hmm. So if you miss the instructions, they are at the top of this uh, presentation display. So again, if you could design your classroom to be any way you want it to be, what's the first change you make? And I love this first one, no grading. <laughs> um, up there, mental the QR top. code. Oh, the QR code. code. Yes. I think, is it? Yeah, I'll just go back. It shows it on the yeah. <laughs> what if I wanted to make that full screen? Simple, and all students can sit facing the screen, which is not the case. <laughs> Outdoors, love that one. I really like that one too. Community base. Oh, I'd be curious to hear more about that yeah. idea, and we'll have a chance to explore these later in more depth. <laughs> Stop ringing soon. <laughs> Here's a desk on wheels. Some classrooms have that, but most of them do not. Students and instructors get to choose modality, and I guess as part of that, the university supports those modalities. Comfortable seating, couches, Pillows also kittens. kittens. <laughs> We're working on the budget for kittens. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Pillows. Um, I did work at a school that had a stress relief class about different strategies, and there was a week where uh, students played with puppies. Uh, yeah. Um, and so I'll. Uh, Hand it back over to. Sh oh, yeah. I teach remotely. I would love to find ways to make it possible and welcome for students to have their cameras on for remote instruction. That's a great one. And it yeah. puts out like this, it's, there's factors in there that are so far out of people's control. Like, do they have a private space to study? Do they have a working camera on their laptops? Um, do they, um, you know, have a lot of other distractions and things pulling them in different directions where they might need to step away or, you know, be paying attention to children or older adults or whatever other responsibilities they might have. So. I love these ideas. Let's yeah. let's keep them keep them going, keep yeah. thinking as we as we continue. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Larry. But in graduate, is there some thought about and I, I don't know in my first semester, so mm -hmm. in graduate classes, is there some thought about uh, How to, how to transition into a professional role after school. And, you know, I don't know, if, you know, you talk about comfort, right? And I, I certainly don't assume that anybody's gonna come to class in their pajamas, but, you know, maybe. So, but is there some, I, is there some thought about how to, um, certainly by setting the example and hopefully, you know, yeah. setting some tone in the class, but yeah. is there also, um, Something along the lines of you want people to be they're you know they're in a class about a particular topic you know it leads to a particular profession right what you would assume what class do you or what school are you in SPA but in, in yeah. teaching global governance I mean you're not going to go to a you know a UN conference in your pajamas so like is there some thought about like how do we model you know what is expected what we think is expected as a professional of students once they enter the workforce and yeah. you know, um, sitting on couches is probably not, I don't mind it at, at a class, but it's probably also not what they're going to experience. 
get into a you know a government job or yeah you know. I think there's a couple different ways of looking at it and I'll give you like a a quick response but we can talk about it more also later but um one thing is the they're in your class to learn so what thinking about like what is the situation where they will learn the most but also you don't want to break down those like unspoken norms of the industry that they're going in because you're not serving them if you don't tell them the things that you know that will put them at a disadvantage if they don't do these things later so i like to think about um does this you know need to be the case for the whole semester is it the case that you really get into these norms for maybe a final presentation and you have that you know the professional outfit and comportment and all that and maybe you book a room that's a different style room or something for a particular assignment where they learn those norms so just thinking about do they need to be meeting these norms all the time does it help them with their learning or would it somehow maybe hinder their learning maybe they don't have enough professional outfits to get them through the whole semester yet and that might cause like embarrassment or they might not show up to class because so thinking about like when is it actually something that i'm like a skill how to show up to these meetings versus um norms just to create norms that maybe might actually be barriers for students. Sure. I, see that. I, I think that's a good example of something that you could explore with speculative pedagogy. So we'll talk more about what that is like in a second. But um like is there like can students can we imagine a world where um like comfort is the highest priority when we work in the corporate world? might be hard to imagine but like that could be a challenge to students is like think about that or what would that be like um if you worked in like a setting that really prioritized your comfort or your, your like your mental health or well-being or whatever it might be um and then to I think Mary Catherine makes a really great point which is like we can teach the um skills without necessarily adopting them so we can prepare students for a professional setting without necessarily having them practice it every class because like Mary Catherine says right we don't know what students have access to so we can train them for that real world but we don't necessarily have to duplicate the real world in class if that makes sense I really like the idea of turning it into like a, a unit in itself you know and practicing that yeah great question all right so thank you for getting started with us um so an overview of what speculative pedagogy is so there's two broad areas of application that we're going to talk about. The first is students imaginatively envisioning new possibilities using their experiences, interests, and the tools they learn in your course. And the second is faculty imagina imaginatively <laughs> envisioning new possibilities for their classrooms using their experiences, interests, the tools they learn in various trainings, and the related speculations of students. And so we want to emphasize it's not just the teacher imagining, it's a sort of shared uh, process between instructor and student of imagining together. And uh, there's other names that you might see in publications about this. Speculative fabulations is a fun one. Speculative envisioning, speculative change, speculative practice. There's all different names for this. Um, but let's talk about like what the roots of these ideas are and what they can mean. Okay, quick quote. Whereas traditional design legitimizes the status quo, speculative design envis say envis envisages, yes, <laughs> I always want to say envisage, and anticipates the future, at the same time helping us to understand and rethink the world of today. This approach is most often based on the question, what if? So what, what if, right, we had a world that looked like this? What if education looked like this? So the intervention, a critical intervention here with speculative pedagogy, uh, which is illustrated a little bizarrely, but I kind of like this graphic, um, is typical classrooms train students in what currently exists and how to think critically about problems immediately arising from what currently exists. So here you see problem, problem, pro problem, right? And then can we come up with something to address the current problem? It's often a technology. So we made this new thing that solves the problem, right? At least temporarily. Um, and uh, but the, one of the issues here is that you don't end up looking at the systems that create the problems as much. It becomes more of a reactive sort of solution in the moment. And what some authors talk about um, is that this can encourage a sort of like a nihilism in a sense of like not taking responsibility for that future. So saying like, well, things are just going to keep 
problems are just going to keep popping up and there's not really anything we can do about it when you could look at the system and ask how that could change. Um, and that also encourages this idea that like there's a one in a million genius who can solve the problem and come up with the best technology to address it. And so what if we shift it? So I, I, I like have a, I feel like I did this diagram, but I also feel like I don't get this diagram. So I just want to throw it out there, but I, I like the idea that it's suggesting. So here we're saying speculative pedagogy asks students to imagine alternative realities that aren't confined by what currently exists. This moves away from a consumerist model, right? Products, we use products and technology to address the problems that come up and resist being trapped in the familiar. So you might, you know, well, it's always been like that, or that's just how it is, right? And what speculative design practice or speculative pedagogy offers is moving outside of what might seem practical or realistic into something unfamiliar. So what if we move outside of what we think is actually possible? Could that be possible? Can we make that possible? Erica, anything to add? Um, yeah, I think one of the things I liked about this is just really quick about the critical design or critical practice in our classrooms where we are getting sort of past the moment what we have now in the traditional practice. Um, but it's very much responding to what we have now um, versus the speculative is is like kind of saying, you know, what if we just started from scratch almost? Then it, it never really is starting from scratch, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but helping to get out of that, like the, the confines of what we experience in, in the day to day. So a couple more quotes here. Building on this capacity of stories to bring us into new relations with the world across time, speculative future oriented storytelling and speculative pedagogy can offer us new modes of thinking and new paths forward beyond paradigms of capitalist continuance and or totalizing destruction. So this kind of comes back to the point about like problem and then technology as a solution. So like, what if we have, what if we imagine a solution or a systemic change that is outside of the realm of capitalist continuance, right? Like we don't imagine a product solves the problem. What else could solve the problem? Or this sort of idea of like, oh, well, you know, everything's gonna kind of collapse eventually. So what's the point in trying, right? So to speak more on that quickly, um, I want to address the theoretical foundations of uh, uh, that's really, really important to a lot of Black feminist theory. Um, oh, good call. <laughs> All right, hopefully that makes it a little easier. Thank you very much, Catherine. So um, speculative, so we, we had some diagrams that sort of illustrated the importance of speculative design in or speculative work in like design spaces, especially graphic design, but it also has an important place in a lot of black feminist theory. So speculative storytelling would be like science fiction or fantasy, right? Where you imagine a different world. And an important question is when you imagine another world, what components of this world stay? So if I imagine Star Wars, right? And I'm like, I'm at, this is a huge, you know, this galactic, you know, soap opera. But did I continue with the gender binary in that world? Did I imagine everyone's a man or a woman in that world? That tells you what I think is unchangeable about this world, even though we know there are non-binary folks, right? So what would Star Wars look like if it, you know, imagined a world without the gender binary? Right. So that reveals to us what parts of society seem natural or unchangeable to us, that familiar stuff we tend to get trapped in. So if you imagine a new world, so what can you leave behind that you take for granted? And there's also a, a level here of privileging. There's a privilege in refusing futures. So there have been different sort of movements, especially queer movements in like the 90s, uh, theoretically and activism wise that have said, well, we don't really have a future. So let's kind of like give up, you know, let's just kind of, <laughs> let's party. <laughs> um, you know, we don't, we don't have anything to look forward to and, you know, technology is going to destroy everything or whatever, whatever. And so why even try? And something that the black feminist theory here is pushing on is that is very privileged to say like, uh, you know, I don't want to worry about the future because there are more marginalized folks who have to make it to the next day. So this sort of like queer anti-future rhetoric or this, this nihilist 
sort of rhetoric of like giving up is rather privileged. And that's what these authors are trying to point out. And so to complement that, there is a sort of responsibility to believe in a better future for people who are uh, in a more, let's say, marginalized position than you might be. So we have to do that internal work, not just trying to make society better through changing systems, but internally, we need to do work of believing in a better future and taking accountability for helping make that future. So I've listed three authors who I really like who talk about this. Um, and then here are their books here. Um, so I like that sort of like, there's a necessity to imagine a better world, even if it's on others' behalf. So a quick example is that I have studied and done activism around uh, preventing sexual violence for a really long time. It's important to me to imagine a world without sexual violence. I think that is like necessary because when people imagine a world where it's like unchangeable, you just kind of give up, you know? But what if I pushed for what seems unrealistic, a world without that violence? Maybe we could reach it actually, if we believed we could. So questions, thoughts? <laughs> We'll take a break for questions in just a second. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then finally, here's speculation as responsibility. So this is from a talk by Jen Ross that I really like. Um, and she, again, uh, she like poses speculation as a type of responsibility. So instead of focusing on what can practically happen, could there be like, you know, could there be a, uh, like, let's move outside the practicality. Let's move into something that might even seem absurd. Um, and then whose futures are we imagining? So often when we talk about the future, we might say, oh, and, you know, I hear people say stuff like in the future, everyone will have a floating skateboard, you know, and I'm like, well, rich people will have floating skateboards. They're not going to be like handing them out at the library, right? So like, whose future are we thinking of when we think of a future? Are we thinking of multiply marginalized people and how their future might look? So, and then again, resisting this horizon of change, like, oh, change will come later. You know, just just hold on. It's not us. It's the next people, but it's always the next people, right? So what if we take accountability? Taking an active role, taking complicity in systems or understanding it. And then finally, just something important for us to generally keep in mind is there's a pedagogical responsibility to reflect curriculum in instruction. So if I'm teaching students, the world can be better. The world should be better. Then I have to mirror that in my assignments, in my grading, in my activities. Right. So if I say, oh, you know, the world is so ableist um, and then I make students, you know, meet in an inex inaccessible classroom, what message am I sending them? That it's not possible. So how can we show students like, it is possible, right, or to imagine that, which overlaps also with culturally sustaining pedagogy, which is something that uh, Mary Catherine <laughs> is very well versed on. Um, yeah. I'll just say really quickly, okay. cultural sustaining, so we don't throw it out there and then leave it alone. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> just that um, that culturally sustaining pedagogy, uh, like one of the big tenets of it, is acknowledging that um, our mar a lot of marginalized groups already have tools to resist dominant um, different forms of domination, and that we rather than like having to kind of reinvent the wheel, we uh, can look to these communities to incorporate uh, ways to break out of the patterns that we have that might be harmful to people. So kind of going into that responsibility, um, it, it doesn't have to be all on our own, but we can you know work together and come up with new options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that I think connects with like imagination as a survival strategy. Like for a lot of groups, like you have to imagine a, a better future, you have no choice, you know? And so uh, taking accountability for that. Okay, just a quick, another fun diagram, just a quick sort of like, you know, to show sort of the different fields that speculative design has sort of bloomed in. Um, and then it's got a sort of, this person's ad, added an axis of like constrained, unconstrained, which is itself a little like vague of a term, but I think you could see there's more of this sort of humanities, like art, things that are hard to define in terms of what you produce and then strategy. So then, uh, you can see science fiction comes in there because science fiction does actually help us make and imagine new worlds and new technologies, uh, future studies, uh, and then like design. So this is sort of like some of the origins of the theory that we're talking about today. Yeah. 
Okay. So pause for questions, thoughts, ideas. Or like just a thumbs up <laughs> or a thumbs down. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I just want some clarification on the slide about responsibility. Yeah. Uh, an example is say, imagine the future for Africans. Yes. Um, my imagination for them, or my thoughts about their future, may not align with their own thoughts about their future. Mm. And I think understanding having, you, you also have a responsibility to. to match those two ideas mm. to, to understand their imagination for the future and to incorporate that in as a as a perhaps more privileged person how you are contributing to the reality of what that future might be for them mm. and making sure that you're not dominating their you know, their future because there, there is um, methods of resistance that come with that so are you yeah Trying to think about it as I say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that what you were trying to get out of that responsibility for. Yeah, and I think that. like the culturally sustaining pedagogies, like like yeah, like centering mm -hmm. like like marginalized groups and asking like like I love that like what what do you what future do you need or what's a sustaining future for you and respecting that and dialoguing with that. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah, just making sure folks on Zoom got that all right. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just, as you were talking about expectation, I was thinking about how we might rethink teaching, rethink the whole yeah. process, of, and you know, wacky ideas like the ones that were put up earlier as well. No, but I was thinking of what if we let the students teach the teacher? Uh, yeah, you know, instead of addressing it as how do we improve what we're doing. Approaching it as how do we redo everything? Yeah, so that it creates a lot of overall product. Absolutely, I We're love that. that. In a little bit, yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> Your check is in the mail, so yeah. help. Um, no, I, I really appreciate that. Any other thoughts or comments? Excellent. Okay. So, okay, so it's like this. <laughs> so we're going to talk about now application so we're going to talk about going back to that earlier slide thinking about how we can get students to do this speculative work within your field but also how we can do the speculative work as teachers creating classrooms so first we'll talk about sort of in the field um, but we can also use this these techniques other places too um one is storytelling this came up already you can do it in a written way you can do it in a performance way um using the concepts in your course that students are dealing with um, have them create short stories, graphic no novels. They can do creative journaling. They can do improv. Like, how can you incorporate spaces for students to tell stories that they want to see exist in the world, um, or maybe even that they don't want to see exist in the world? Maybe it's sort of a getting into, yeah. that, um, you know, what if uh, we continue along this path? Or something? But um, another one is um, maybe more relevant to something like engineering or civic education, maybe business, I can think too, but using maker spaces to create physical products that don't exist in the world yet. We have a maker space in the library that you can use with your students. I'm sure the librarians would be excited to get you to use it with them. Yeah. Um, but thinking about like model cities, tech, all that kind of thing, what can you, how can you get students to like, not just sort of think about it, but really get involved and excited and, mm -hmm. and make it a, a mini reality that's a little closer to becoming the reality. Um, another one that I um, learned about just researching speculative pedagogy, but it's called civic composing. Um, and this is a multi-literacy sort of students drawing on a lot of different types of knowledge to envision alternative futures for our society. And then by imagining them, kind of making them real for just a moment. So they can connect ideas across time, space, identities, both in the past, think about alternative futures. 
It can include graphics, music, narratives, histories, um, maybe civic principles or mm -hmm. principles in your field that are relevant, um, mixing different kinds of analyses to, to decide what would be effective, quantitative, qualitative, and incorporating oral histories from other people. Um, all of these different things to sort of come up with a new society. Um, yeah. I got ahead of myself, sorry. <laughs> Another one is um, that I thought was interesting is like there there are games that exist in different fields to help students make a world. Um, it can be either like a card game where students pull different characters or different um, ideas or op opportunities, different um, institutions, that kind of thing that they they use to build a new system. Or um, it could be creating like a video game. This user or they don't have to do like the programming, but. Sort of, <laughs> interacting with the video game in a way that that builds a new world. And I'm not an expert on gaming, so that's all I'm going to say about that. But, uh, future not, workshop yeah, future <laughs> in workshop. the future, gamification. Um, and then the last thing is designing their own games. And so maybe again, like if they're really tech savvy, designing a, a computer game, but even designing a card game where it sort of gives people options of, you know, what if there was no gender binary? What if um, there was no food insecurity? Mm. Or at least it's like, how do we get to there? So an example project for you guys to now see like what this might look like. And mm -hmm. this is one in sustainability. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I I thought it was interesting. I thought they did a really great job with it. Um, so these are, um, this is called Plastic Bowl Foods, speculative design project developed by a young international interdisciplinary team from the University of um, Amsterdam. So it's a new waste vision. So this is where a team of students decided to envision combining organic ingredients and recycled plastics to create food products aiming to raise awareness about waste management. Um, the project addresses the psychological distance people have from food waste and waste as possibly reusable, making the issue more personal and relatable. So what we have over here is like the, the food that they 3D printed and um, developed a whole marketing plan for, and then you have to take it with um, these pills that help you digest plastic. And so they have this whole, this whole like alternate reality of how we consume materials. Um, it highlights the negative impacts of environmental pollution on our bodies, gets us thinking about um, sustainable uses for waste. Um, and um, anything else I wanted to highlight here, but um, yeah. And then they ended up presenting this as an art installation that had QR codes that people could walk by and scan that took them to this like fake marketing website, but then also a, um, a page on the website that had links to sustainable initiatives in the area that people could get involved with. So what they found, they tracked the clicks and stuff and found that people were engaging with the sustainability links um, and potentially, you know, people who might not have gotten to those links otherwise, just because they wouldn't have known they existed. So having that interaction and getting people involved um, ended up being really effective and just a quote from the article that was describing this speculative design should be utilized more readily in our necessary global transition towards sustainable development it has the power to highlight invisible or subconscious issues and behaviors it has the power to make abstract issues concrete and it has the power to make global problems personal for people from all walks of life um, and one other example that is takes a very different direction but i think is also really interesting and engaging. So this was from a single student. Both of these are, um, I think they're both graduate students or projects for these. Um, but this was uh, speculative development of Bratislava. So this student, Lenka Hamasova, used fiction and speculative design to critique these controversial urban development projects in Bratislava, highlighting concerns about population density, traffic, um, gentrification, and what they did was create these postcards of the future. So they took these wide angle lens photos like in the top right, and they made a collage out of them with all of these different images that they associate with the gentrifying city. So you like front and center, we have a Starbucks cup. We have people doing yoga in a park, um, food, food trucks, tons of people, a bus that looks like it's one of the double decker buses mm. from London actually. Um, and, VR. and colorful and it's like it's enticing but then what does it mean for the community and so up at top left here we have people looking through their vr goggles so this student created a, a virtual reality experience for people to walk around Bratislava and see what's here and what's this other future that might be coming um 
they actually still exist. The photos ended up getting uploaded to Google Maps. And when we share the slide here, if you want to click on the link, there's links to the Google Maps images in there that, that come up, which I think is really interesting. Um, and one thing that ties into the responsibility element is that this um, student, uh, quote from their article, the clever use of fantasy, self-irony, and visual hyperbole was typical among dissidents criticizing the repressive regime of the ruling Communist Party in Czechoslovakia. So now she's using the same um, techniques to question the repressive regimes of private companies and neoliberalism today. So drawing mm -hmm. on those experiences and, and histories um, to create a new, a new project. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that's key in integrating speculation into your classrooms is incorporating reflection. So could you click one more time? Jenny? Yes. So sort of how it stands is we have the, the past and we reflect on the past and we come up with new presents and we connect the present to the past. So the next level is we come up with this sort of fantasy, this other world, and then we, we want to get students also to connect that fantasy to our reality today to, to get to get there potentially. So have students reflect on, quote, which key features of the experience, practices, materials, people, technologies, mediate participants' reconstruction of their social, cultural, and political identities, end quote, to disrupt current systems of oppression. So what does it mean when someone says they want to have their classroom outside? What does that tell us about what it feels like to be in a classroom right now, or they want kittens there? <laughs> you know, um, what it, and then how can we, how can we get there? Um, so a few tips for educators that um, are interested in enacting speculative pedagogies. Um, ask students how they would reimagine a specific relevant issue. So instead of just saying, like, come up with a new future, you know, that can be really overwhelming. Maybe prison abolition, maybe sustainable uh, industries, or, um, you know, she teaches in, in uh, yeah. gender studies classes. Yeah. So, you know, other ways of constructing gender in our society. Yeah, yeah. Um, give them something specific. Scaffold it heavily to avoid overwhelming students. So give them kind of a step at a time to get there. Maybe starting small and building on that. Um, provide clear examples along those lines and, and um, clear prompts. So if you can find examples of something similar online, like these projects might be big for the scope of, of your classes, but even if they are big sort of examples can still be helpful and, and you can clarify from there. Give a lot of feedback on dra drafts and prototypes. Again, this is something students don't often do in, in school is sort of have the freedom to imagine whatever whatever they want. So give them a lot of feedback to make sure they're hitting the expectations and the learning goals you have for them. And then um, include a lot of opportunities for your students to reflect on what they're doing. Make sure that they're not just sort of coming up with something absurd to come up with something absurd, but they're doing it in a way that helps them you know, learn about what it says about our world, what the possibilities are of the field generally. Um, you can have them journal about the process or do like, uh, you know, thinking about it before and after they do the project, that sort of thing. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll say for now, um, maybe next page. Sorry, it, I, uh, I like clicked a bunch and so now I'm scared it's gonna go forward. So we're just gonna do this. Oh, <laughs> Lo loading. Hold, please. Are you going to share an example? I, I just had a realization that we incorporated some of this in the recent papers. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. that's awesome. So I could share an example. We that got this good. idea from design students at you know, another my computer is having a little bit of trouble, but go oh. ahead and I will try um, and figure it out. Yeah, maybe I'll. It's interesting. <laughs> you can try putting in mine instead, but we have to get these set up. So maybe you can like share your example really quick. Okay. Yeah. So this is in the context of I helped manage, I helped to design a complex course about wasted food. Um, so at the end of going over different perspectives on wasted food, thinking about environmental, economic, um, policy and whatnot, they end with this activity from aggravations to action. So we start by asking students to list out aggravations they have about wasted food. So let's mm. say stuff like 
I hate that the grocery stores throw out X, Y, and Z, or um, I get really angry when my roommate wastes their leftovers. Um, and then they discuss their aggravations and they talk about what systems are fueling this and what do these systems value and prioritize? And then what are some of your values and did, how do they align or misalign with those systems? Um, and then when they discuss action steps, it's what can you do about this, but also what does an alternate future look like in which your values are upheld um, and this problem doesn't exist anymore. That's a great example. I'm going to ask you to type a summary of that in the yeah. chat. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A great example of the, um, of the um, like scaffolded process. So you're not just saying yeah. what other future do you want, but you know, reflecting on problems now, reflecting on values and, and making it really clear that they can draw on all those things to envision that other future. Um, and I think highlighting that these solutions don't have to necessarily be realistic. Like we're mm -hmm. trying to create something that may or may not even be feasible, but that's kind of the point of this right. speculative pedagogy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. Should maybe <laughs> it's, it's like go back to the, yeah. yeah, just have that solution. Yeah, we'll just do this. So um, a few more tips as you're, um, we talked about sort of applying it with your students, but applying it for your own courses. How do you want to re-envision your own courses? Finally getting what the hell is from yeah. earlier. But um, treat students as adults. So give them agency and space to speak. Um, it connects again to sort of you're not necessarily the expert on it, or you're definitely not the expert on other people's realities. They are. So how do you incorporate their voices? Um, and centering student voices and ideas. So especially in a classroom, if you're the professor, as soon as you say something, students are gonna think that they need to believe the same thing. So making sure they have, that students have a space to explore their own ideas, values, creativity, without, um, not that you can't say it, but just being mindful that once you say it, there is a pressure, even though you, know, you don't want there to be pressure, but there is a pressure that students um, feel they need to agree. Uh, collaborating with and supporting students to envision what that course could be. So um, what, um, th and then going back and asking, you know, how much can you enact? Uh, what does their envisioning say about their career realities? And again, going back to the very simple example of having class outdoors, like, yeah, on nice days, you can have class outside. That's, a, that's an easy thing to implement. Um, it can happen, these kinds of conversations can happen in formal and informal spaces. So you can have a creative essay, you could have a project around it, but you can also just talk to students in office hours on a discussion board, um, small in-class activities to check in with how they're feeling. Um, and then finally, reflect on your own educational experiences because you do have experience as a student. You have experience as a teacher. You're also a member of the classroom community. What do you want also? And that, that does have room in there, um, but just be mindful of the power dynamics of the classroom. Okay. Um, I'm gonna jump to critiques. Um, so a few critiques of speculative pedagogy. Um, the first is that some folks quite reasonably feel it's not beholden to critical practice. So it can feel, and this connects to the second bullet, that it can feel idealistic, not tangible, not practical, right? It can feel like, oh, you know, we're not, it's not, we're not uh, accountable to creating something or changing things. Um, but I think that can kind of overlook like the, the importance of imagining. I think sometimes imagining is work in itself um, or is, it's like an accomplishment in itself. It can be um, rigorous in its own way. Um, so it can feel to people like, you know, it, like it doesn't directly address or base itself in our current reality. Um, and which is understandable. It, it's kind of not, but it is meant to help us understand and critique our current reality. Um, that folks also critique that there is a limited applicability outside humanities, but I think that, so I can, we can again understand this critique, um, but I think Mary Catherine has offered some really interesting examples of how it can apply in a lot of different uh, disciplines. And so um, while it might feel a little more familiar as something to try in a humanities course, um, I think it's worth trying in any course, as long as there is, if you're thinking about the future, which I think all of our courses are in one way or another. Um, uh, 
uh, something to keep in mind is that um, it doesn't get us away from classroom power structures or university expectations. So someone said they don't want to grade anymore. And a lot of us use, some of us use ungrading, um, but we still have to give grades to the university, right? And so it can feel difficult to say to your students, you know, we're breaking out of this, but I do need to give you a grade, right? And so that can be a hard sort of like a thin line to walk and, um, it can, it's helpful, I think, to acknowledge that you're still working within different systems and might be limited by different systems. But can you can you offer students that space of the classroom to imagine what would it be like without grades? What would it be like with or without this? Um, and then, as mentioned earlier, um, it can default towards a sort of dystopian imagining or giving up on the future. Um, so the sort of roots of speculative design in like graphic design, um, there's a lot of like people saying like, well, you know, it's just, it's the future's going to be terrible. <laughs> you know, it's just going to be a big mess. Um, and, and everyone's going to be upset. Right. So then like, how can we break students out of that? Like, could we take responsibility to imagine a better future, but what responsibility does that mean? Or what do you have to do to enact that? Okay. Who wants to see it? Uh, no, should we go to the Activity. Yes. So we have a little um, moment for you guys to practice now and again, just like the last session. We only have five minutes left, but we'll give you pretty much the, the at least a few minutes. And we can also circulate if you guys have other questions. But thinking back to that first change you'd make, um, we wanted to give you a chance to do a little bit of your own storytelling, practicing that speculation on your own. So free write, think in your head, we only have a few minutes, but what, what would it what would a class session be like in in your ideal in your ideal teacher world? What would that look like? So take um I don't know should we shorten it to like maybe thirty seconds and then yeah. explore these ideas a little with your with your colleagues um and we'll regroup in a couple minutes. The session's almost over, but we just yeah. want to just wrap up really quick after this. So take a moment to think, um, brainstorm if you want to speak with someone and share ideas or think about how it can be enacted. Um, some questions to think about. How are you already creating that space in your courses? What is possible? And what would you need to change for that to be possible? <laughs> That's doable. <laughs> People who, yeah, can share. If you're online, feel free to share ideas in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's it. maybe ask people to share. Well, we have this last slide. It's up to you. We can either ask people to share or that last slide is important. I want to leave that last. Yeah. So to. Well, we I'll just say we hope oh, you yeah. can continue to think about these things. Obviously, two minutes is not enough to integrate speculative pedagogy into your course, but we would love for you to use whatever you were just thinking about and what you learned today to, to continue working on it. But yeah. Yeah. So so we want to know what can what can we do? Um, to help your classrooms be what you want them to be. So like what support, so it could be like a format or topic or resource. Um, what can the CTRL provide to help you make your classrooms what you want them to be? And if you're online, please feel free to share in the chat or you can raise your hand and share something. I think it'd be great if, um, 
to provide sort of a continuous um, set of examples, maybe as we were talking about including the class, yeah, things that other instructors or professors come up with that should be shared in the class, yeah, around faculty that would make sense that would fall squarely in that category. Yeah. Out of the box. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think we could probably include some of our own um, stuff that we've tried yeah. in our classrooms and how that went. Um, Sarah shares a classroom which everyone is mature enough to respect other members, even marginalized individuals. The instructor's behavior is a model for students. I love that. I think that's excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> oh, that's Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Other thoughts that we'd like to share? I know we're right at time. All right. So um, thank you for your patience with our various technological <laughs> challenges. We really appreciate it. Um, so just to let you know, we are going to share this slideshow after the session with you all. Um, and, uh, thank you for joining us and, uh, we are very excited to hear from you. So if you want to get in touch with us, share ideas, um, schedule a consultation, just whatever it might be, this is our contact information here. Um, and as you can see, the slides are going to have a lot of resources in there for you to check out if you're interested. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I really like that. All right, I'm going to leave these in room. I think. Oh, you know what? I did this. What? Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Okay, I'll do that again. Okay. I forgot that that feedback. Oh yes, yeah. Feedback. That would be great. There's also paper ones outside if you'd rather um, just fill them out quickly. They're, they're very appreciated. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to unplug. I think, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs>